From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. So let's talk about timing. That's another question analysts are trying to answer. With all this long-standing stuff in the mix, all this tension, all this enmity, all this dream of a resurrected empire for literally decades and decades, why did Putin wait until recent years to hone in on Ukraine? There are a couple of factors that come into play. First, the previous U.S. presidential administration was quite problematically pro-Putin, even when it ran against the interest of the people of the United States. Which, you know, politics aside, that's not the job description when you're president. <laughs> I think that's safe to say. I don't think that's a hot take. And uh, the previous U.S. administration was instrumental in brokering some of the things that Russia wanted to see. Weakening of NATO via Brexit, uh, failure on the U.S. part to hold, help hold Russia accountable on previous agreements and so on and so on. And then secondly... And I wonder if this is being brought up more and more often. The global pandemic, COVID, may have delayed some of the actions here, may have delayed some of the actual deployment, because like when the Biden presidency took office and, uh, you know, Biden has been a, a, a longstanding uh, vocal opponent and critic of the Putin government, what what happened it may have been it may have been just the harsh reality of a global pandemic and that means in a weird way covid may have saved some lives or at the very least delayed some bloodshed which is weird but, to think about but but a question that i've i've had and i've heard other you know folks on uh, pundits and, and the like uh, uh posing is why didn't he do it under trump because Trump was so cozy with him and it seemed like it would have been optically a better move and he probably wouldn't have imposed the same sanctions or at the very least not as severe. Like why wait until, you know, a presidency that is clearly vocally uh, in opposition to you, like you just said, Ben. Sometimes you got to get the chess pieces in the right place. And if they're not quite there, you don't, you know, make the move. <laughs> I don't know. That's the only thing. That's the only thing I can imagine because it does. It does. I like what you're saying here about COVID, Ben, because it does feel like as the as President Zelensky comes in in 2019, you know, there's a window there between him, you know, getting into office and a move to be made. I feel like I think it's U.S. presidency changing hands, and it's also Ukrainian presidency changing hands. Uh, you just look at those two timelines, how they overlap, and then where. COVID fell in to just push it back to 2022. Mm. Oh, yeah, the peaceful passage of power. That's a really good point. Uh, and then third, for a variety of reasons, maybe most notably U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, Putin and his team may have decided that the U.S. was at a particularly weak point, which is true. The U.S. is uh, at a weaker point, or it was quite recently at a weaker point than it had been in the past few years for a number of reasons. So, Maybe this, maybe this was part of the calculus. I think it almost certainly was. Also, note part of the domestic issues in the U.S. were created and escalated by active Russian cyber warfare. So he's well aware of that. Uh, when he recognized those Donbass republics as independent states, he tremendously escalated everything. And this turned into a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. That invasion is a brutal signal to the West that Russia is not going to accept any arming of or placing weaponry in Ukraine, Poland, Romania. There are other factors here that are, I would say, possible factors. Like, unfortunately, it's true. If you are flagging and domestic support in a lot of countries, one of the quickest ways to jack up your domestic support is to, in, is to have a war, just like that film Wag the Dog, you know? Which is an enemy. It's the truth. You need like a common right. enemy, right? Well, let's let's talk right. about what happened right. with Putin's approval rating after the annexation of Crimea. According to yeah. The Guardian and several places writing in 2015, his approval rating hit an all time high of 87 percent in July of 2015 and an all time high of 89 percent in June of 2015 after the annexation in 2014. Uh 
And mm-hmm. and again, Are like numbers slanted though. Like I mean, is that coming from the average? you know, younger generation Russian, or is this like, well, is this, I, I just well, wonder, where's this coming from? I, I don't know <laughs> necessarily, but, but the same polling found that his approval rating was in the sixties, just a few years prior to that in 2012, 2013. So like, if it is mm. a slanted poll, e- even, you know, if you just think about it that way, it's up 30, 39% from a few years ago. Significant. Yeah. What's that old joke? Uh, ass. I asked Russian friends how things were going over there. He said he couldn't complain. Yeah, literally. <laughs> That's so, ah, well, gallows humor. So there's a, there's also the idea you'll see conjectures regarding the mental state of the individual Vladimir Putin. Uh, again, conjectures about mental state can be difficult to prove, especially when we're talking about one of the most protected people on the planet you know it's not like think about how difficult it is to get medical information about presidents we in the u.s i mean we talked about that in presidents and substance abuse but it doesn't unfortunately for a lot of media outlets it doesn't particularly matter if you can whether you can prove something about someone's mental state it makes for a good headline so your mission is accomplished and that's sad to say and and of course i say that with all due respect to the actual investigative journalist who are busting their asses doing amazing work here it's not like there's some clause that can be triggered oh well Putin's mental state is waning. There's something that's triggered by that that we can like oust him and replace him. That's just not in the cards. You just now yeah. have a very, very powerful leader who is potentially, you know, dealing with a uh, depleted mental state and everything that yeah. goes along with that. No real checks, uh, no real checks on power, no real balances, no actionable thing like the 25th Amendment here in the U.S., which means that a president can be removed temporarily or permanently when they're unfit for office. But while there's a ton of reporting about expansionist would be imperial Russia, and while those reports are true, people do believe that this could also be an attempt to create, however violently, buffer states. And buffer states are another, like, I'm telling you, a lot of this stuff is not original. And things in geopolitics are rarely original, which we'll talk about more in the future. But uh, a buffer state works from the russian perspective nato expansion decreases russian security because if you're a nato country the united states of america can build military bases on your land that's a big no-no i'm trying to think in terms of analogies like okay you live in a suburb right you're russia you're the biggest house on the block and there's something like a, a really weird hoa that's coming into town right and They're saying you don't have to join, but they want everybody to join. And then your neighbor might join. And if your neighbor joins, that means they're going to invite their pal, Uncle Sam, the guy you fucking hate most out of everybody in town. And he's going to be like hanging out there at barbecues, right jumping next on your to your trampoline, back, you jumping know. on trampolines right next to your backyard. Uh, and the worry is that one day Sam might just stay. He might even eventually Forget whose yard is whose. And that's why you have to think about buffer states. You have to think about things like the DPRK. There is, um, you know, North Korea, I mean, borders Russia, right? It borders China. Uh, and I don't think Russia or China in particular would like that peninsula reunited under a democratic South Korean led government. That's just inviting Uncle Sam to the God. backyard. So uh, I, I know that's a fast and loose thing, but I think it works. Yeah, I think it's clear. Oh, it is. I do think the HOA is a very specific HOA of drummers. So like everybody coming in and joining up, they all become drummers. And then there's just people playing drums in houses all around you. It would be the worst. Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> says a drummer. I mean, having one drummer on the block is enough. Like, <laughs> yeah. having, like all of a sudden, every house has a drummer and they're playing at the same time or at all hours. Then, you know, you got yourself a problem. And it might just start as a nuisance and then escalate into, you know, that's a slippery slope. And then all of a sudden the drum set's set up in your living room and <laughs> you can't do your Zoom work calls anymore because right. of all the racket. Uh, yes. There are signals coming out of mainstream media about actions China is taking and North Korea is taking and Belarus is taking and uh, all the NATO countries are taking. And it's feeling more and more like 
everybody is getting involved that you mentioned there, Ben. But for mm-hmm. the most part, in, in the anti-Russia direction, I mean, I believe it was, you know, China abstained from from a, a, a vote um, in a couple other countries as well. Um, but they also haven't come out vocally in support of Russia, who I believe as recently as, you know, a few months ago, um, no, it was more recent than that. I believe Putin was over there and said something to the effect of that the relationship, the friendship between China and Russia was like unshakable. Yeah, yeah. It's evolving minute by minute. I'm reading right. a lot of stuff specifically about Taiwan right now. The, mm. You know, that's a shaky situation, but it appears to be evolving uh, day by day. Nothing is nothing occurs in a vacuum. Everything in this sphere is precedent as well. Uh, and and China is uh, currently working on, as we're recording, some uh, trade trade barriers with Russia. Uh, they want to, of course, China wants to maintain stability and grow its own global position. But when we get to present and future concerns, there's much, 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 much more to explore here. It is right to say that the Russian Putin perspective leaves a lot to be desired in the way of factual support. It's not our opinion. It is demonstrably false that Ukraine is run by Nazis. It is also demonstrably false that Ukraine was never, quote unquote, its own country. The people voted to be so. And these facts add up to real world tragedy. As we're recording this week, just so you know, folks, the numbers stations went active, which is not a good sign. Putin also put nuclear weapons back on the table, uh, so back on what his are the enormous number table. I, I just don't know if everybody knows what that is. I, I don't. We I, just I, talked about uh, it in listener mail, maybe. Um, I kind oh, of know yeah. what it is. Can you just really quickly just say yep. what it is? It's a technology used for spycraft that originated in the Cold War days. It's basically codes. They can be sent out over the radio. They can only be understood by people who have a key. And it's generally, I mean, it's used by a lot of different countries, this this technique. But in this case, it's specific frequencies that Russia uses to communicate with actors who are abroad, who are not in it's Russia. It's like what happened in, um, in uh, Dr. Strangelove when they're like trying to interpret the like codes on the plane that no one else can read. And it's telling them to either like deploy the nukes or back down. It'd be, it'd be stuff to that level of uh, extremity. Possibly. Well, it's tough to know unless you unless you have that one time code. So we know they went active. We also know that economic warfare is in full swing against Russia. Recent military actions indicate gross miscalculation on the parts of Russia. Their military is capable, yes, of destabilizing areas and of raising the cost of independence or non-compliance, but it does not at this point, seem capable of controlling a country that has nearly 40 million people in it, or even a city like Kiev, which has uh, like 2.8 million. And I want to add that I've been looking at, I usually don't do this, but I've been looking at stuff actively because we're talking about an ongoing event. It looks like just a few hours ago, the news hit that uh, someone leaked Someone leaked some documents from Russia's military that projected the war in Ukraine was meant to last 15 days. Uh, Ukraine got a hold of Russian military plans from the 810th Brigade of the Black Sea Fleet Marines. And Turkey also just denied Russian warships access through the Bosphorus. So is there not a bit of a sense that Putin sort of overplayed his hand and undercalculated a bit in terms of like how easy it was going to be to take over an entire country that he, you know, the, 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 uh, the force that he deployed, is not nearly enough to hold even the capital, let alone the entire country? Right. You have to ask about the stabilization versus occupation, which are two very, very, very different endeavors. But yeah, it, it seems that it indicates gross miscalculation on his part. But again, we are coming to you from a week in the past. We hope that this message finds you healthy, finds you sane and finds you safe. Uh, our thoughts go with the innocent people of Ukraine. And to be very, very clear, and I, I think we need to make this 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 distinction more often uh, in, in these conversations. We're not talking about the people in Russia, the people in Russia who are just as innocent and probably, you know, off, probably don't support a war. You know what I mean? Especially once the economic sanctions are in full effect. Uh, there are innocent people 
on both sides of every conflict. And that's not a middling equivocating statement. You know, I'm, I'm not going to pull out that old rant about elephants and grass again, but it is very, very much true. And you need to remember that a, uh, we all need to remember that a nation's people are not necessarily the same as a nation's government and they don't have uh, the same control. While it might be convenient to lump a bunch of people into one monolithic group and say, ah, they're terrible. That is only convenient because it is inaccurate. Um, but at this point, we want to hear from you. We want to see what you, your take is on the context here, what your take is on the Russian perspective, what you think should be done, what you think will be done. Um, what do you think will be the future of the people and the government of Ukraine? Can't wait to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online. <laughs>